Okay, we are ready to get started with our webinar for tonight, and we do welcome everybody to the Shabbat Shalom Hebraic Studies Webinar Bible Study Series. This is a unique point of view that we take, which is the Hebraic Roots point of view, and you'll see that as we go through this and why that's important. And we also will remind you as we get into this that these webinars, even once they're completed, will be posted on our website so you can view them at any time, 24-7. There's no charge for that. So those are always there, and all the past ones we've done are already posted there that you can look at any time. And we strongly encourage you to do that. So this is a part of a series of studies that focuses on building an understanding of the Hebraic roots of our faith. The Hebraic roots, which I'll mention in just a minute a little bit more clearly, are an essential viewpoint to understanding Bible study as we go through it. And this is something that Carmen and I have been doing for 25 years, so we've got quite a deep background in it. And just to introduce ourselves, I am Neil Johnson, and joining me is Carmen Rachel, who is our prophecy teacher, and together we combine our efforts to put these series together, and we hope that you'll find them very, very beneficial and a blessing to you and to your own Bible studies. We hope that it's an encouragement to you to do more and deeper Bible study on your own. Just a quick comment about understanding the Hebraic roots of the Bible. What that means in essence is that you have to realize first that the Bible is very ancient. It's a very ancient collection of books that stems back in time from 2,000 to 3,500 years old. And also it's a book that's probably entirely written by the people that we today identify as Jews. It is largely about the nation of Israel and their relationship with their God. And that's a good way to understand it. But it also means that when we read it, we have to make a recognition of that point. And it's very hard to read the Bible as if we were understanding it in today's 21st century in the Western world. We have to make a real effort to go back in time and view it as it was written at that time, 2,000 plus years ago, and understand the ways and the expressions and the thinking, the language that was used at that time, because much of what's discussed in the Bible or represented in the Bible, we've never experienced. So we call that the essential context of the background of the Bible, and that's why it's very important to have this vantage point, which is the best way I can say it, to express and understand the Bible in a very, very appropriate way, in a very insightful way. I always like to say that this is our ministry's mission, and this is the focus of everything that we do. Tonight we're going to take a look into the promises of our Lord conveyed to mankind by means of a unique commitment he made that can only be properly understood from the Hebraic roots vantage point, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. And Carmen's going to get into that in quite a bit of detail and show you some things that you've probably never seen before and probably didn't even know you didn't know. <laughs> the story of the Bible is largely the story of Israel as a people and as a nation and their relationship to the God of Israel. Through their history, we learn about God, his nature, his character, his Torah, that means instruction, and that's very much what we're going to be talking about tonight, and about his love. We also learn that God has a plan for Israel that is not yet complete, and that through Israel, he will be glorified. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This quotation from Genesis 15, verse 6, sets the stage for the most important promise ever made. And understanding the background, nature, and consequences of this promise is fundamental to an accurate understanding of the message of the Bible. This study will take you back to very ancient times when traditions and practices played out that most of us have never likely ever seen. Here is a classic case for the Hebraic Roots vantage point. So allow yourselves to travel back in time to a day that existed literally thousands of years ago, and yet to see how the events of that time profoundly affect us today and for all eternity. Well, tonight we're going to look at the Abrahamic Covenant in depth and also ask some questions. 
So you might be paying attention. We may ask you questions at the end of this webinar. And I have playfully called this the things that you didn't know that you didn't know about the Abrahamic covenant. And I have to confess that I chose this humorous title in, in an effort to draw attention to our webinar on Facebook. We found that some of the more clever titles seem to draw more people. So that was my purpose. But I think it's an interesting title. And then I ask a serious question. Is this covenant still relevant in the New Testament age? And how does it relate to us today? And I think the answer may really astonish you. Abram is used 54 times in the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. Abraham is used 162 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And Abraham is used 70 times in the New Testament. So it's obvious that it has an importance in the word of God. The Abrahamic covenant was the beginning of the everlasting covenant, which presently exists between God and man. It began as a blood covenant with Abram and expanded to include more and more of his offspring. We can see the covenant pattern in that the Lord first called himself the God of Abraham, and then the God of Isaac, then the God of Jacob, and ultimately the God of Israel in an everlasting covenant. Today in the fullness of Messiah, we can all have access to his redemption, both Jew and Gentile. And that is why the Abrahamic covenant that has been renewed in Christ is the better covenant, as salvation can come to all who will receive him, and not just the Jews as it was originally. In Psalm 105, 711, it states, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, and that's a Hebraic way of saying forever. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute and to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. As we look into this, we will gain great insight about the covenant. And we're going to see that the Lord enters the blood covenant with Abram. And there are three specific promises that he made. The first is, I will make you a great nation. And the second is, your descendants will inherit this land, and your seed will bless the world. In ancient royal land grant treaties, the blood covenant was done to seal the covenant promises. In this case, the Lord was confirming his three promises made to Abraham namely, the promise of blood heirs, of land, and blessings. When the Lord made these covenant promises to Abraham, he graciously reassures his promises with visual evidence of his presence. The blood covenant was the most sacred of the covenants. And here we see that the Lord commanded Abram to prepare to enter the blood covenant, and this was called the walk of blood. And so I'm going to refer to that, so I just want you to see what this is. And the Lord explains it more in Genesis 15, 9 to 10. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Abram was seeking reassurance from the Lord for his promises to him. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. What's interesting about this is that five is the number of grace. God required five sacrificial animals, and five is the number of grace. This blood covenant will be a covenant of grace. And the emphasis on blood is necessary because the Lord states there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And the Lord also states that the life is in the blood. So as we go on, we see someone that's walking through what's called the walk of blood to enter the blood covenant. The parties involved would walk the path between the pieces as if to say, may this be done to me if I do not keep my covenant oath. These two people are becoming one as the animal is really one. The animal's lives were given in place of the covenant partners and represented them. 
By this act, they were indicating their willingness to give up their rights to their own lives and begin a new walk unto death for the sake of the covenant. They would hold hands and form a figure eight as they walked the walk of blood. They did this because eight is the number of infinity and new beginnings. Forming the figure eight symbolized the eternal and never-ending nature of the covenant. The animal's blood was a substitute for their own. When you enter a blood covenant with someone, you promise to give him or her your life, your love, and protection forever, and marriage is a blood covenant. Abram prepared the covenant sacrifices as the Lord instructed him, but a great test presented itself. And in this scripture, in Genesis 15:11, it says that as Abram was preparing the carcasses for the walk of blood, that vultures came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. As he was preparing these offerings, vultures descended on them to snatch them away, and he defended the offerings from the vultures. This is a lesson for us today and comes from Matthew 13 and the parable of the sower. When we are about to enter covenant with the Lord, demons, or what is described as satanic birds, will attempt to snatch away our blessings from the Lord. This is something we should be aware of, and Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 13. Then Genesis 15 goes on, and it says that after he had sent the vultures away, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and a great darkness fell upon him. And as Abram slept, an astonishing thing happened, because another entity of fire took his place on the walk of blood. Now as we look at this ancient image, we can see Abram sleeping while the fire of God has taken his place, and in this image we see the animals and the fire and the smoking furnace, which is the description of what would come to pass. And in Genesis 15:17 to 18, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So a fiery presence appeared in place of Abram to walk that covenant walk. A similar description is used when the Lord descended in fire on Mount Sinai and denoted the presence of God in the fire. And so that is the same here, that the flaming torch and the burning oven was the evidence of the pre-incarnate Messiah, the second person of the Godhead fulfilling the walk of blood in the place of Abraham. That is why the Lord states that he has sworn by himself in various scriptures, such as Hebrews 6, 13 to 14. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And then in Hebrews 6, 17 and 18, it says, Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So the two immutable things are, number one, the oath that was sworn by the Lord, and the second is that it is impossible for God to lie. So that is where we place all our hope for the future promises of the Lord, and that is why we can have faith in the future promises of the Lord. So that is to say that the pre-incarnate Messiah passed through the sacrificial animals. It was Yeshua, Jesus, the second person of the triune Godhead, who sealed the Abrahamic covenant and took upon himself the responsibility to fulfill the covenant promises made by the Lord to Abraham. Nothing depended upon Abraham, but everything that is related to the covenant depended upon the redemptive work of his Messiah and the Lord's faithfulness to accomplish his covenant promises. Abraham and his descendants could trust in God's immutable oath to perform his promises. In Jeremiah 33:14, this is one of the promises because he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And for people who are with us all the time, we know we're seeing many of these things partially being fulfilled in our own time. Now, there are seven more steps in entering the blood covenant that are distinctly messianic. 
And that is the reason that it is applicable for us today. As Messiah is the true covenant partner in the Abrahamic covenant, we will recognize the amazing provisions of the covenant through Jesus that can change our lives forever. Now, the first act was exchanging garments. And we see here an image of David and Jonathan. And I'll read this. It says, Another important step of entering the blood covenant was to exchange garments. By exchanging garments, they are signifying that all I own I'm giving to you, and all that is yours is available to me. The garment represented the person. Jonathan and David prepared to enter a blood covenant in 1 Samuel 2, 3-4. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. And so we see the messianic fulfillment, that Jesus covers us with his righteousness. Jesus exchanged his white garments of righteousness for our rags of unrighteousness. That's what we have to see in this. And then we find more insight in Revelation 3, 4-5. And here we see the bride dressed in her white garments. And Jesus is speaking to the church at Sardis, and he says, You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Here Jesus is speaking as the bridegroom to his bride. And the next step was to exchange belts. As we saw in 1 Samuel 2, that Jonathan and David both exchanged garments and their belts. And when you exchange belts, you are saying that your enemies become my enemies. Jesus exchanges his weapons of warfare with us. And you can read that in Ephesians 6, 13 to 18. And we pledge to enter the spiritual warfare with him and battle his enemies even to our death. Because the belt held their weapons in place, it symbolized the power and might of the covenant partner. By exchanging belts, they are pledging their strength, support, protection, and ability to fight for and defend one another, even to the death, for the sake of the covenant. Now the next step is to create a scar as a memorial. The scar is a permanent testimony to the covenant. It is always there to remind the partners of their covenant rights and responsibilities. Messiah bears his scars on his hands. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's one of my most favorite scriptures. And what is our scar? Our scar is a circumcised heart. And here we see that it says, Sometimes God doesn't change your situation because he is trying first to change your heart. Neil and I know what that's about. (laughs) We we walk that walk quite a few times. But we have another scar, and it is God writing on our heart. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And I would say Torah instead of law, but I will put my Torah into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. That's another scar that we have as our memorial with the Lord. Now the next step is to exchange names. And when they exchange names as a means of identifying with one another in the covenant, as they are now known by each other's names, they are expected to think, talk, and act like their covenant partner. And there's also an implied power of attorney to use his name and powers for the goals of the covenant. Jesus took on the name of the Son of Man, and we take on the name Christian as identifying us as those who are in covenant with Christ, the believers, the faithful remnant. And God takes on the covenant names, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Israel, ultimately. And in Daniel 7, 13 to 14, Jesus is revealed as the Son of Man, when he appears before the Ancient of Days to be coronated and receive the kingdom without end. I like that image, so I put it there. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Now the next part of this is to establish the terms of the covenant. And as we see here, it is Torah, 
And Torah is a Hebrew word for the instruction designed to teach us the truth about God and ourselves and how we relate to him. As you can see, this is far beyond law. This is about instruction for life that is pleasing to God and that brings us salvation. Torah means instruction, teaching, and instruction of doctrine. And I think that's so important for us to recognize because so much of our history shows us that the Hebrew Bible was rejected as mere law, but in fact it is the teaching of God. And in the terms of the covenant, they would pledge their commitment to assist each other to accomplish the ultimate goal of the covenant. The goal is to restore God's relationship with mankind through the redemptive work of Messiah, and ultimately to restore God's kingdom to the earth when Messiah brings in the Messianic Kingdom Age. The terms of the covenant are eternal and passed down to all generations. And that's why I want to put this scripture in, because it is the underlying promise of God's immutable promises to Abraham. The underlying everything is the statement, I will never break my covenant with you. I haven't counted how many times he said that, but I know we constantly are bringing up these statements of his immutable promises. He's never changed them. And I want to make another point, too, that if we say that the law is done away with, and for people on our webinar who are new, replacement theology is a deep stumbling block for many today, because replacement theology says that the New Testament replaces the Old Testament and that the Old Testament is irrelevant. And if that is the case, if the law is done away with, why do we find Yeshua teaching it after his second coming? And this is literally in the scripture. It's Micah 4, 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples or nations shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion... The law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, the law should be Torah. Out of Zion, the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I think that is a very convicting statement if we really want to understand God's purposes and his ways for the end of the age. Now, the next step is to eat the covenant meal. And the Lord sent his priest Melchizedek to eat the covenant meal with Abraham and to bless him. And Melchizedek is the appearance of a theophany, which is a pre-incarnate appearance of Messiah. For those who are new on our webinar tonight, I recommend that you might look that up, theophany, and study that because it will be amazing to you. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. The covenant meal symbolized their covenant union. The bread represented their bodies, and the wine represented their blood. The bread and wine represented their lives, which they are pledging to each other to the death. They would feed the meal to each other, and the two became one in covenant. And as we look at this vision of Jesus at the Passover, Jesus fed us with the Passover bread that symbolized his body and the wine that symbolized his blood. We review this every year at Passover because it is a memorial to Jesus as the Passover lamb. And here we can see the four cups of the Passover and the matzah and the Seder and the Haggadah. Now, another step, and it's one of the final steps, is to establish a memorial. The memorial is meant to be a covenant reminder to the partners and their heirs continually and forever. The cultural memorials were to plant a tree or a stone and sprinkle it with the blood of the covenant. One of the memorials established by Jesus is contained in the sign placed over his cross. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Luke 1.33 tells us that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And also in Philippians 2.20, it states that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So that is his memorial that was on his cross. 
but he also plants another memorial. In Mark 8.24, it states, And he, Jesus, looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Now, again, for you who are new, we've done a study in Joel where God describes his people as certain fruit-bearing trees. And at the end of the age, his will is stated in Isaiah 61 and 3. His will is to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And going on with this theme, Isaiah 55 and 12. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. This is a reference to the coronation of a king. They would have the acclamation of the king, which was everybody would clap their hands. And here we see all the trees, all the people in the world will clap their hands when Messiah is in his kingdom. Ezekiel 34, 27. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bonds of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. As we look at the situation in the world, especially the Middle East, we certainly can say this has not come to fulfillment, but it will definitely be completed when Jesus returns. So Paul sums up all of this in this scripture. He says, also, if you belong to the Messiah, you are a seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. We can only understand what Paul is saying if we know about this from the Hebrew scriptures, if we know about the Abrahamic covenant and the Hebraic source from the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. And as I said when we began, the answer of how relevant is the Abrahamic covenant for us today, it is truly amazing to realize how important it is for us in this age. A lot you can draw out of this. This has been a great insight into the making of a covenant and what that Abrahamic covenant means to us today. And we should all understand that. Unfortunately, this is one of those things that I think is largely lost within Christendom today and virtually unknown because it is part of the Old Testament. And that word old is really devastating because it seems to imply that it's something that is past and no longer needed and has been replaced by something new. Just those simple names are very, very destructive to our attitude and our understanding of the full Word of God. And what you see in this, and the reason that we stress so much this Hebraic point of view, is that what Carmen's gone through brings up at least two things that are very important. One I'll just mention very briefly, and that is the reference to Joel and how in those days it was common for people to speak allegorically of men as trees and other references similar to that. And the study that we did one or two lessons back about this really helps you to get an understanding of that, you might say, ancient thought process, an ancient way of seeing things, where in Hebrew, The language is much more visual or image-oriented than our language in either Greek or English today. So you have to realize and understand just the thought processes of people who lived at the times of the Old Testament. And the other point I want to draw out of this is the importance of understanding what I would call covenant language and how we have to bring this forward, this understanding of the covenant, and see how it's applied in the New Testament Because if you strip away the Old Testament, then you lose that essential connection and that essential understanding. And I'll just give one quick example of that. That is where Jesus says to his disciples, anything you ask in my name. Well, to anybody who lived at that time, they would understand the covenant implications of that statement. That means if you're disciples of mine, if you entered into a covenant relationship with me, if you use my name, then you are speaking as my representative. And that is part of the covenant relationship. And that's a kind of essential understanding that's important to have to fully understand the Bible. And there are many, many insights like this you get as you start to study the New Testament where it just opens it up like a brand new book. 
because you'll find that your point of view changes so radically as you see it from this Hebraic standpoint. Well, I'm going to go on with some continuing thoughts about covenants. And I'll start with this comment. There is a majority tendency within Christendom today to dismiss the Old Testament as irrelevant because that strong impression has been taught from so many pulpits for so many years. And the result is that much of God's word is dismissed, unknown, and unstudied. This prevalent attitude is a disaster for the spiritual health of believers today since it takes away from them the very foundation of what God is desiring to teach us. In the words of Paul, all scripture, and that reference means the Hebrew scriptures because there was no New Testament at the time he made that statement. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So to that point, here's a very revealing chart, and it's one that we've shown before, that shows precisely just how much of the Old Testament, and I hate that name, Mm -hmm. is found in the New Testament. If you look down the column that shows the percentage of Old Testament verses that appear in the New Testament books, you'll be astonished. It probably averages about 30% of every one of the books and some are as high as 60 plus percent, almost to 70. So it's extraordinary. And when you see this, and this is a very objective statement, this is not opinion, this is not an impression, it's not subjective, it's very literal, it's very objective, and it's important to understand that. That's why these two are so important to lock together. And you see that illustration down below of the Old Testament being joined to the New Testament. And again, a quote from Paul in Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And I have to stress again, whenever that phrase of scriptures is used, there's only one scriptures it's referring to, and that was the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament today, because none of the New Testament existed. So, very simple to understand that's very true and you can come to that conclusion on your own again it's not opinion so here's the problem virtually everything revealed by god about his covenants with man is contained in the hebrew scriptures the singular source of quotation for our messiah that is that is the only thing if you read through all of the books of the new testament the only thing he ever quotes is from the old testament it's exclusive There are no other sources. Therefore, how can anyone expect to know about or understand God's covenant promises if they never read the books of God that contain that information? You cannot do it. The Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament are interlocked. They cannot be separated. The Hebrew Scriptures are the foundation upon which the New Testament is built. And Carmen knows my favorite reference to people who have only a New Testament is it's the amputated Bible because the foundation's been cut off. When Jesus lectured his disciples on the road to Emmaus to understand why he had to die, what did he tell them? Did he read from the New Testament? Not likely, since not one word of it would be written for another 30 years. But here is what he did do, and this is the quote from Luke. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And again, at that point in time, there was no New Testament. Everything he's saying there is pointing back to what we call the Old Testament today as the things that explain about him. Well, Carmen has just given us an excellent insight into the Abrahamic covenant and described the outflow of its significance to all mankind. You can see from this that an understanding of how God uses the word covenant in his word is essential since all of the promises of the Bible rest on the relationships established in the biblical covenants, especially the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. And this is the one that took place in the book of Exodus while the nation of Israel was camped at the foot of Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And I want to talk a little bit more about that particular covenant. Alone with her God, Israel was about to enter into a marriage covenant with God. Now, it may sound a little unusual, but that's exactly the way it's referred to in the scriptures. And it is this covenant that now becomes a true two-party agreement 
that is ratified in blood and is forever binding on the whole house of Israel. The covenant relationship tells us clearly what God requires of his people, that they listen to his voice, walk in his ways, and obey his commandments. The people agree to this set of requirements, which are written up in God's instruction, which is known in Hebrew as Torah, and was referred to in the New Testament by the name of the appointed author, Moses. So that means whenever you read a reference to Moses in the New Testament, it usually is to the first five books. However, it became apparent that the nation of Israel was not up to maintaining its part of the covenant promises, and they often failed, sometimes horribly, in fulfilling their side of the promise. In fact, the Hebrew scriptures are largely a history of Israel's failings. But more importantly, the same books are also a history of God's love and forgiveness for his wavering wife. What we need to learn from this is that God never fails in his part of the covenant relationship. God uses the story of this relationship with Israel as a picture of his relationship with all mankind. And to this point, we often recommend that when you read the books of the Hebrew Scriptures, that you insert your own name in the place of Israel. And by doing that, we will all get a good picture of how the Lord sees us and our record of failures and sins. God has a plan. And in fact, he has always had a plan to deal with man's sinfulness. He knew that man, on his own, and even with the instructions of God on how to live, would never be able to maintain his covenant promise. God's plan was to take his book of instruction and write it within us. And Carmen's already referred to that. In the process, however, our old nature would die away and a new nature would appear to take its place. And this is exactly what Jesus meant when he said, your old man must die and you must be reborn like a baby. You must become a new person. And here is that plan taken directly from God's word. As you read this, note to whom this promise is addressed. This is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He doesn't say he's making it to the Christian church. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. And there you have the identity that he took them in a covenant relationship as a wife. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, literally Torah, and that's the word in Hebrew, in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now that's a unique statement, because the only way that can happen is if sin is dealt with in a very thorough and total and complete way. And we'll see exactly how that happens in a moment. God is now, through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming us from the inside out. Interestingly, this exact same promise is repeated in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. That is the quote I just read from Jeremiah 31, wherein the writer of Hebrews uses this as the means to illustrate that Yeshua HaMashiach is the final and perfect sacrifice to fulfill this ancient but unchanging promise. And if you're not familiar with that name, Yeshua HaMashiach, that's a Hebrew name for Jesus. It means Yeshua or Jesus, the Messiah. Further, he demonstrates that Yeshua is also the final and perfect high priest that completes and fulfills the line of priests that have come before him. He enters the heavenly tabernacle not made with hands and presents all who believe in him to the Father in the Holy of Holies. When you read this, you immediately understand that all of the patterns presented in Moses, which is the Torah, were meant to prepare us for this eventual future moment when mankind would be restored to God and his holy kingdom would be reestablished on this earth. But here is where we are presented with an interesting question. 
in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, most Bible translators use the word new in reference to the covenant that God is promising to bring forth. But what is to be new? God has clearly stated his ultimate purpose for covenant relationship. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. In fact, he repeats this over and over throughout the books of the Hebrew Scriptures. So what could be new in a new covenant? What else could God want to achieve other than what he has already stated? Would a new covenant have some different goal? If so, where is it stated? And what could it possibly be? The fact is that there is not a new covenant statement to be found in the Bible. It does not exist. In fact, to suggest that there is some new relationship desired by God would be to suggest that God had made some kind of mistake that had to be corrected through some new kind of agreement. So, a better way to understand that expression would be with a more correct rendering of the word new as renewed. This word in Hebrew can be used either way. But God is not saying that he needs something new as entirely new. Rather, he intends to renew his covenant, but now ratify it in a final and perfect way. Now the covenant with God will be ratified in the blood of the only begotten Son, the Lamb of God. All of this understanding comes together very, very beautifully, I might say, in Psalm 51, where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That word renew in Hebrew is the same one that's used as new in Jeremiah verse 31, where it says a new covenant. Psalm 51:11, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Just as Carmen noted earlier, nothing depended upon Abraham, but everything that is related to the covenant depended upon the redemptive work of his Messiah and the Lord's faithfulness to accomplish his covenant promises. We must remember that God never changes and his promises never change. And from 1 Samuel, the quote is very appropriate here, also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind for he is not a man that he should change his mind. God is consistent and unchanging. In God's fulfilled covenant, all men are drawn in, both Jew and Gentile. In Ephesians 2, 11 to 16, this is stated very clearly. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. In the fulfilled covenant, God no longer sees Jew or Gentile, but only his people. They are one flock, abiding under his shepherd. It is about a process of transformation, and this is the ultimate goal of the covenant for God's covenant people. Two very appropriate quotations, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And from Colossians 3.21, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, 
just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That is, as God transforms us through his Holy Spirit and writes his Torah in our hearts and in our minds, we become very much the nature of his Son. That's the transformation that he desires. As you can see, understanding of the concept of covenant is fundamental to a full and complete understanding in God's word. With this view into the scriptures, you can now see how earnestly God desires to ultimately see that we are his people and he is our God. So that completes the webinar we have for tonight. And I want to repeat again that if you're interested in learning more on this or any other subject we teach, please go to our website where you can find a collection of the Hebraic Studies articles of the last 16 Shalom radio programs and all webinars that we presented to date. And you have the website right there, www.arielministries.net. So now that we're completed, I'm going to open up the phone lines and hopefully we have some thoughts, questions, or comments from you folks there. So everybody should be able to hear one another at this point. Anybody would like to jump in, please, in fact, I might ask uh, Steve Montgomery, because you said that this is going to be something very new to you, how it came across. Was it too much, too new, or did it give a core of information to you you found helpful? Way too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to start with, what is shalom? What Shalom? Shalom. It, it's the Hebrew word for peace. For peace. Okay. Well, that, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, the full name of our fellowship, means Sabbath peace. And it's, it's okay. like a greeting you would hear if you were in Israel. You'd hear people say Shabbat Shalom. Very common. The interesting thing about the webinars, though, is that we post them again. And you can go back and review it and look at it slowly, more carefully. Right. Many people go back several times to get the, the information. Which we would definitely be one of those people that we'll have to definitely go back to it and 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 take our time and and try to understand or go over it several times to with Matt's help. You there, Matt? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you said that. I, I know that this was a lot of information, and it's pretty deep. That is, we don't do superficial Bible studies. That we really get deep into the Word, and we want to get a very, very thorough and comprehensive understanding. And that's the way that you have to do it. You have to really be dedicated to that. And if you do, you wind up finding that it really blesses your understanding of God's Word. I'll turn on our camera too. So, deep is the the key word there uh, for a beginner like myself and Marcy. It's it's all very very. What's the word? Foreign. <laughs> Foreign. Yes. <laughs> That's what we you. thought too. Uh, Ten years ago, when we began uh, uh, coming to uh, Neil and uh, Carmen's talks, we thought. I don't know. This is all foreign sound stuff. <laughs> but uh, but I don't right. But it but it's something that uh, we look forward to understanding. And and uh, we haven't. I haven't myself read the Old Testament really at all. So yeah. Well, that would certainly make it seem to very start foreign. with. I was told to. I'm sorry. That would certainly make this seem very foreign if you've never heard any of this. Then it's got to be very strange. No, not not much of it. It was started out. They told me to read John in the New <laughs> Testament. Uh, well, this seems to be the the main uh, book they have you start with, and and of course we've read the other books in the in the New Testament, but very little in the Old Testament. Well, so, the, the covenants are are very foreign to us. Um, Yet our connection, most of our, our connection to Jesus and His salvation are are through is through the covenants. And what we see as we look at these Bible studies in this sense is that we see the activity of Jesus prior to His being born in Bethlehem, 
which of course was spoken by the prophets. So it gives us more knowledge and understanding of what his mission is in the world and what he has accomplished in this age. That started way back then, not just in the yeah. New Testament. Right. right, that's the essential understanding is that, uh, as you saw in that one chart, which uh, I think really makes a very important point of the number of Old Testament scriptures that are contained in the New Testament, that is, when you read the New Testament, you're reading a lot of Old Testament because so much of it's quoted there. Unless somebody points it out to you, you might not be aware of that. Never put it together. Right, right but you'll never put it together without the foundation. Right. That's where everything starts, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's a solid foundation. Well, again, just that understanding that when Jesus is speaking and, and talking like the scripture I quoted a little earlier you know, from Luke, where he has to stop these disciples on the road to Emmaus who have just heard about his crucifixion and they're downhearted and they're walking back to the hometown. They think all is lost, our Messiah is gone. And he comes up to them and reveals himself and then has to start all over again in Moses, the prophets and the writings, which is a specific way in that day of referring to what we call the Old Testament. And he has to say how all of these things are about him. Yeah. Right. And and tell me, Craig, do we sound as different now that you're used to this? No. Uh -uh. Uh, I was going to mention, when they pull a shofar out and blow it, that's like <laughs> a big ram. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I looked at Carol and said, what is this? this is strange stuff. But it's no, right uh, out of the so Bible. None of, sound, none of it sounds strange to me at all. Yeah. None that's of great. Yeah, isn't that great? You know, I learned that Jesus is a Jew. Everything that was important in uh, what what I would like to call the New Testament uh, or, or, or the uh, uh, the First Testament instead of the Old Testament. It seems to me the First yeah. Testament is, is a better description. Sure. That everything we've learned there and reinforced and, and amplified and, and referred to again in the in the Second Testament uh, is it all makes sense. It all fits together. There's nothing contrary. Right. Uh, there's just these funny names. But then again, I'm really happy that they have good American names like David and Mary and John. <laughs> That's good. Instead of the old no, Hebrew names. Like, yeah, you know. It's really hard to follow it if you use all Hebrew names. Very hard. Well, the fact is, John and David, and they probably are Hebrew names. Well, some, David, some are David David is Hebrew. But uh, John was Yohanan, mm -hmm. and uh, Matthew is Matateu. <laughs> so uh, we've lost the, that... What we often say is that the, the Bible, and through the translators, has become so anglicized that we lose that connection with the Middle East and with this uh, uh, Hebraic background that is vital to our understanding of it. Because, Steve, you said that you had read the book of John. Well, in the book of John, if you remember, in chapter 7, it starts talking about the Feast of Tabernacles of the Jews. Uh, do you recall that? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not. Not a very good. No, 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 no but I, I'm not surprised because most people don't because they don't relate to it. Now, if it had said it was uh, the Fourth of July, all of a sudden you would have had a recognition because it's something from your culture, from your lifetime, right? And you know it, so it would stick. But you read something about the Feast of Tabernacles. You've never been to a Feast of Tabernacles. You've never seen one because they stopped having them two thousand years ago. So okay. it means nothing to you, and that's true for just about everybody who reads it. Yet, as you read through that, and some of the studies we do, and we did one recently on the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus makes two of the most profound declarations of his deity yeah. with a, mm -hmm. the context of the background of the Feast of Tabernacles. But if you don't understand what the Feast of Tabernacles is or what's going on, it's meaningless. Actually, you can, you can yeah. look at that on our webinars. It's called the right. Feast of Tabernacles, and I think you would like that. Yeah, we'll write that down. <laughs> the, the main thing is... For picking on me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, you're, you're just willing to be more uh, vocal and speak up and uh, express how you react to this, which is very helpful. But it's not unusual. I don't, don't feel like you're yeah. somehow different because this is all so new to anybody. I'm, I don't care if it's somebody that's been going to a church for 40 years. This will all sound mm -hmm. very new because generally they never hear it. And Matt, what did you think of tonight? Oh man, tonight was a 
Beautiful. Um, you know, just uh, understanding Blood Covenant um, yes. and seeing all the different parts uh, that, that go into that, all the different steps, and then, you know, how you guys showed, you know, the exchanging of garment, mm -hmm. you know, that he clothes up in his righteousness. I never put two and two together that that was an actual step to a Blood Covenant. Yeah. And sure. I almost my eye because I, I, just, I seen it for the first time. It's like, wow, never caught that before. I know. That was a faith changer for me. When I began to learn that study, that was a quantum leap for me because I, I was able to connect all of the things and really, really see how Jesus is such a major part of our, our redemption and how, how sad it is that it's not recognized today because I think many people would have a quantum leap of faith if they could get that kind of uh, feeding into their spiritual life. Oh, yeah, just even understanding, you know, a, a white wedding dress and what yeah, that sure. actually... Jeez, oh, Pete's, you know, he, you know it, completely... There's so many things like that buried in the scriptures. That mm -hmm. It's like digging for, for hidden treasure to dig these things out because suddenly you, you, you see something, you know, my gosh, I never, I've never i read that scripture a dozen times and I never knew what it meant, and suddenly it comes together. Give that dog some popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Whose dog is that? Uh, that's, uh, Wiley. Yeah, that's my dog. Yeah, well, we've been eating popcorn all night, but then again, <laughs> soon and I'll just mute, and then, then I don't have to answer questions either. Yeah, right. You don't have to. Uh, can anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Can you, um, this, this, is this is Marcy. I'm sorry, the, the Shabbat Shalom, what does the Shabbat mean? I okay. know Shalom is peace. Oh, Sabbath. Uh, in, uh, of course, you know, it's the, the fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath uh, and keep it holy. And uh, the Hebrew name is Sabbath, and it means the seventh day. And in Israel, if you were there, you'd find everybody is running around like crazy on Friday because it's called Preparation Day to get ready for the Sabbath. And they would be constantly greeting one another saying, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, meaning will you have a peaceful Sabbath? And, and for us, for us, why that is important is because the Sabbath is a type of the Messianic Kingdom age coming in. We don't do this in a legalistic sense, but on Sabbath, on Shabbat, we do remember the promises that of the Lord of the future age, and so that's why we've called our fellowship that name. Okay. Once you understand it, I think it's a really nice thing to think of. You want to have a peaceful time where you draw away from the world and you draw close to the Lord, and you ask to be renewed and nourished in his Holy Spirit. So I still have to vacuum on Saturday. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, anybody else? Uh, what about Jim Fer Ferrer? Am I pronouncing your name right, Jim? Jim Furman. No, no that's Ferrier. not Ferrier. Oh, Ferrier. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. He just he just tried to call me, but I <laughs> is, I declined the call. Is he is so, uh, he one of the people that you've recommended, Matt? Jim Ferrier. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, remember, you can go back now in about a week. And you can go back onto this lesson and break it down and just watch part of it. And, and I, I think that's what we love about the webinars is that not only do we prepare for the lesson, but now we have a record and people can go back and so we don't have to wonder when we can teach that subject again. Right. Now, uh, hopefully you, you who are watching got at least the, the, the sense that covenants are important and that they're important to God. And they truly are the, the core, you might say, of the whole Bible. The whole Bible is about covenants. And it's just not widely known. It's not widely taught. When you stop to think about it, it's self-evident. This is what it's about. The instructions of, of the Bible and what God... Hello, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Is that Jim? Yeah, this yes. is Jim. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. now we can. Yes. Oh, I'm new here, and I just... Figuring out how to get on. Oh, <laughs> did oh. you miss the lesson? No, I, I got most of it. Um, there's um, a couple things I'd like to bring up, but first of all, um, you know, the Bible is one book. Yes. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we have man's put the connotation Old Testament, New Testament, mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, get to it to talk. So uh, it's, it's all one book, but thing that I um, wanted to comment on was we were talking about Jesus and the law. Yes. Jesus fulfilled Mosaic law. Correct. That's right. 
when he died, when he died, the Mosaic Law was finished. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's completed. Let me take a back step. When you go back to John, Gospel John, chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Uh, that's a direct quote right out of John chapter 1, which means that Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God. So he is everything. Everything is fulfilled in him. He is, when you read the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, you can see that it's all patterns and foreshadowings and things pointing to the Messiah to come. He is the fulfillment of it, but he doesn't put an end to it. It all points to him. And there is yet more to be fulfilled. So it, it can't be an end. That's uh, often misquoted that way. But it's a mistranslation. It, 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 it's fulfilled. You would, um, you would check out Romans 10.4. It says very plainly that it came to an end. And when he... Uh, you know, I, can, I can clarify that very quickly. Hello? Uh, that, uh, that word end is a mistranslation. And that's well, Romans 10.4. There's a lot of references in Galatians also about the uh, Mosaic Law ending. Well, it's, it's, it's a poor choice of words because what the word really means in the Greek is that he is the completion and fulfillment or what is being aimed at. That is, the law is aiming at Jesus. And so he becomes the focal point, the completion of everything that it's about. But there's yet more to come. Yes. Well, I look at. I'm, I don't want to big, get a big argument here with you. Well, okay? no, it's an important point. It's a very important point. Well, look at Romans ten four and Galatians five twenty four twenty five. He has instituted the new covenant. You say there is no new covenant. Uh, you reference Jeremiah thirty one thirty one, right. and you uh, go to uh, Matthew when he is fulfilling the. The Lord's Supper at the last Passover, he takes the wine and he says, this is the, the blood right. of the new covenant. Well, remember, so you're, you're reading a translation. You're not reading from well, original God, scriptures or, or you're not there at the original meeting. And there's some real problems with translations today that translators have a bias, we call it spin today, of their own. And so some things are poorly translated, but they're meant to fit much of the what we refer to as the replacement theology thinking of the translators. Remember also that Jesus said in Matthew, I have not come to destroy the law until all is fulfilled. And we can definitely see as we look at the prophetic chaos in the world today, the things that the Lord said would happen, that everything has not been fulfilled. He definitely has not returned. That's not fulfilled. The kingdom age is not here. That's not fulfilled. So what he said is that not one jot or tittle of Torah or law will be changed until all is fulfilled. So that, right. that argues against it. the other points. Well, he fulfilled it, ma'am. When, when he died on the cross, it was all fulfilled. And no, there was, read the book of Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews is instituted. Hebrews chapter 7, it, it's all about the new covenant. Well, it, so. has he returned and has he established his kingdom on the earth yet? No, he hasn't. Well, then it's not all fulfilled because the whole Bible is about that one subject, that he returns well, and restores the, the kingdom. It's in process right now. We are in the new covenant. But, but that doesn't mean it's all fulfilled. Pardon? It doesn't mean it's all fulfilled. That doesn't mean it's all fulfilled. It's fulfilled when he is in the kingdom and, it, and he fulfills all of the parts of the prophecy that speaks about what he will do in the kingdom age. And I read one of those tonight that it says that the law will go out of Jerusalem and all the nations will flow. That certainly isn't happening yet. Well, I know it's not happening yet, but it's, it's starting but to happen. What he said is not one jot or tittle will change in the law until all is fulfilled. So he definitely he fulfilled it all in his ministry. He fulfilled it. And when he died on the cross, I brought an end. So once again, no, it didn't come to check Romans 10.4 and Galatians. There's many, many references. Well, there, again, there, I, if you look into it, you'll find that those are not good translations. That well, I've looked into it, Neil, and that's my comments, okay? Okay. Well, again, as Carmen pointed out, it says in Micah and also in Isaiah, 
that at the end of the age, when the kingdom of God is reestablished, that all the nations of the world will go up to Jerusalem, and the word, and that and word worship in the king Hebrew of Israel, right. is Torah, meaning the Torah of God will go out to all the nations. So it hasn't been done away with. God never plans and to do away with it. They're coming back, and there's going to be a nation of Israel. Yeah, so it all is not fulfilled yet. That's the point. Not one jot or tittle will change until all is fulfilled. And what is all fulfilled is the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant. I, I think that's an incorrect understanding from my point of view. Uh, well, once again, the, 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 the part that's been fulfilled and, and, and completed, Jim, is... Let me, let me ask you this question. Is the Leviticus priesthood part of the old covenant? Is Leviticus 3? What? Is it part of the old Leviticus covenant? Leviticus priesthood. Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. It's part of the Torah. It's part of the it's, teaching of God. It's part of the Torah yeah. that will begin to teach us why Messiah would have to okay. die. Look at, look at Hebrews. Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Right. He's not after the order of Leviticus. Well, it also says that he puts, he's the completion of all the priests that have preceded him. That is, he has completed that part of the Mosaic law. That is, there's no more requirement for a sacrificial system because That's he is right. the completion he is the last of that. Sacrifice. Right. But it uh, still that, is not all fulfilled. But there's more to it well, than that part. Well, not all of those prophecies are fulfilled. That is correct, yes. Well, then it says not one jot or tittle will change until all is fulfilled. And we definitely know as we look at the world today that there is a lot still happening and Israel is the center of all the things happening in the world today, so it's not all fulfilled. Yeah, I mean, when he did that, he was on planet Earth. He was here as the Messiah, and that had not all been fulfilled at that time. It's still not it's fulfilled. fulfilled. when he dies on the cross. Well, are you, are you under the understanding that Jesus is going to return and establish his kingdom here? Of course. So it hasn't been fulfilled. <laughs> So I'm talking obvious. about the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is not an everlasting covenant. Well, we we never said it was. We never said it was. No. Uh, well, I didn't well, think you said I it think was. Maybe we, 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 we could probably spend a whole uh, webinar on just this subject, and I think we've gone round and round on it probably right. sufficiently. I don't want to wear everybody else out that mm -hmm. may have other comments. Right. Thank you. <laughs> but I appreciate the comment, and... Maybe we'll do a webinar just on that specifically, because there's a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of the problem goes back to the translations that we have, and you have to understand that the translations we read today are translations of translations of translations. Well, which translation do I need to read, Steve? Pardon me? <laughs> what translation do I need to, to read? Well, I, I, wish I, I wish I could tell you that there's a perfect translation, but they're not. We... We don't even have... I, well, we can always go, you know, it's a translation. I don't read I don't read Greek and I don't read Hebrew. I have to have a translation. So. Well, you can go back and read the original languages. You get a strong concordance. You can that's look up the use. meanings of the words. Yeah. You know, that's exactly what we do. Well, I understand that. And you, you have to do that. Yeah, there's, I, I, I won't take the time now, but I can point out some really glaring mistranslations and major translations. And so I'm just saying, be cautious about that and don't assume just because something says something like the end of the law that it's exactly true. That's a translator's mistranslation of the original word. And when you go back and study it, you'll find that that's really the case. The, yeah, the, uh, word, the word can be the, the goal of the law or the purpose of the law. Right. In, in, in Hebrew. But there was, a, there was an animus to the Hebraic teaching and Hebraic thought by later translators, and their attitude was to try and put it down, you might say. So they chose that word end as if it was being done away with, which matches this nomenclature that's used of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those are very biased words. You stop and think about that. I'm not sure who named them. Those. Oh, the Romans. The Romans did well, that. Constantine. Yeah, the Romans did. Somebody had to individually come up with that. But when you put those labels on the two books of the Bible, you put a big, big wall between the two. Well, and that's the purpose, too. Right. And it was, to, it was an antagonism to the Hebraic Bible. And it was to actually replace it with the New Testament, which was considered to be the Bible for the Christian church. 
So you get into problems that way, and it's worth a lot of study. There's a lot of history we need to go into, and we're trying to cover, I think, an awful lot of ground and an awful lot of subjects tonight. But I'd like to ask if anybody else has any other thoughts or comments on this. We've taken up a lot of time on that one subject. And, um, I just I have one comment as far as what, what we're discussing and what I'm going to call intense fellowship. <laughs> um, and that, you know, Christ fulfilled the law. Not here. Maybe that's, maybe that's where we're getting tied up is, well, you know, the fulfillment of law. Well, prophecy. But, kind of t- but, but the, the, the Torah and all the law was a shadow of Messiah. And when he comes back, he will complete his original mission, which is to restore, to take back dominion of the earth for God and restore the kingdom here. He's, he's at the end of that, but it's not done yet. Sure. Again, in Luke, Luke 24, verse 44, Jesus says, and this is after his resurrection, he says to his disciples that everything written about me and Moses, the prophets, and the writings must be fulfilled. Get everything. So there's more yet to be fulfilled. Those are the words of Jesus himself. So there are some problems with our understanding, the nomenclature that's used in the Bible, and that really deserves a lot more study. I've actually written a book on it that's published, if anybody's interested in reading about that. But it really takes some thoughtful study to really understand that subject of law and various usages of it. So... I won't go any more with that. Matt, did you have any other thing to share with us of your reactions to the study tonight or any comments about it? Oh, just, I thought that the, uh, the study itself was, was spectacular um, and, and encouraging uh, people to do a study on the word law. Yes. It had many, many different meanings within it. It did. We had our English definition of law and what that means to us. And it really opened my eyes you know, to learn from the scriptures when uh, in the in in the old testament or in hebrew scriptures the word law means instruction you know it's exactly guys. actually matt, and that was a- I'm, I'm sorry matt where you're breaking up but just let me add this that there is no word for law in the hebrew at all law was applied by the greeks they hated the idea of any kind of law that restricted their free thinking their uh, humanism and so they applied that word law to the Torah because they wanted to do away with it as spiritual leadership, as sp- spiritual teaching. Yeah, correct. They didn't like God's moral standards. Mm-hmm. Did, uh, you're kind of breaking in and out, uh, Matt, so I don't know if we heard everything you wanted to say there. I think that was pretty much oh, it. Okay. Oh, by the way, if anybody's interested, I referenced that I did write a book about law. It's available on Kindle, on Amazon's Kindle. You can get it as a download. Just look under the words the law and Neil Johnson and you'll find it very easily. Yes, somebody sent us an email and said it was the best writing about the law that he'd ever read. So I thought that was kind of a nice... Uh, That was. I appreciated getting that. He said he'd read about eight other books on the subject. He thought thought this was the best treatise he'd read on the subject to bring understanding to it. If there are no other thoughts, uh, Steve, did you have any parting comments or shots for us or... Should we wrap it up for the night? I'm good. I, it was very interesting. Uh, I like a good argument. Um, <laughs> debate. I, I think you all did great with that. I'll, I'll vote on, on who won here. In a <laughs> right, we'll, we'll have a vote at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, very nice meeting you two. Yes. And, and uh, Marcy's already hit the couch. Well, I'm going there, too. Uh, it's pretty late for you. There. Well, okay. we, we always close with the ironic blessing. If you want to stay and just quickly recite that with us before, I always want to remind you all that we appreciate you joining us. And if you like this and want to support us financially, we'd really appreciate it. All the information's right there. We're right there. Make okay. a, a donation or uh, go to the website, make a donation or send in a check. But we greatly appreciate yes. it. And thank you. To wrap it up, uh, I chat this first in Hebrew, which you might find of interest, and then we'll say this together in English. Yevarekeka Adonoi Vyeshmareka. Yeer Adonoi Penev Eleka Vihuneka. Yesha Adonoi Penev Eleka. Yesham Wacha Shalom.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shalom alechem. That means may the peace of God be upon you. Shalom alechem. And we always close with this little reminder. People say TGIF, but we say no. Thank God it's Shabbat. It's the Lord's Sabbath. So everybody enjoy your Sabbath rest and have a great day. And we hope that you'll come back and join us again on our next webinar. Really enjoyed having you all. It was a great